Hi, everybody at home. Here we Hi. are back today for our food talk with the amazing Emily Bynum. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It is a great enthusiasm that we welcome you here today. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor and pleasure to meet you and to be here. <laughs> thank you. Thank so you. as you know, uh, Emily Bynum is principal food of the Royal Concert Gebouw Orchestra in Amsterdam. She is, was born in Wales. Uh, she studied with William Bennett at the Royal Academy and with Alain Marion in Paris. Um, and Emily performs regularly uh, in concerto always and also as a chamber musician and in orchestra also. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she recorded a lot of um, solo discs uh, to date. So just to, for you to thought about our first question, uh, we know that you start uh, teaching at the age of 18 and that you never stopped since. Uh, so do you consider it, it it is important that young people still developing their musical maturity start teaching the food? Yes, well, um, I was very lucky um, to have been offered um, a position of, of teaching in a school one afternoon a week from my first year at music college. And I have to say that I have learned so much from teaching and having to explain and having to think about what I do. So I think that teaching is actually a really useful mechanism uh, for learning, actually, strangely enough. Um, and I think maybe, maybe it's like, I mean, I don't have any children myself, but maybe um, I've, I've heard friends saying, um, you know, if you wait until you're ready to be a parent, then you'll never have children. Um, so maybe it's something similar with teaching. Um, that uh, yes, I think it's it's a it's a it's a great privilege to have someone's uh, future development in your hands. It's a huge responsibility, but I think it's also a wonderful learning experience. So um, I would encourage everyone to teach and share their knowledge. Really. Yes. Thank you. So mm -hmm. what do you love most about teaching? Uh, gosh, um, I love, I, well, I've had uh, wonderful teachers myself and I love the, um, the possibility to pass on what I've learned and to hope to be some sort of uh, inspiration in the way that my teacher my teachers have inspired me. Um, I love the moment in a lesson where maybe a student has been trying something and then just the way that you explain it on that day in that way and you see the penny drop, we say, um, that's an incredibly exciting moment in, in a lesson. It's wonderful to watch someone develop through such important years you know the sort of teenage years and music college years i hope that we all continue to grow and develop through our even you know when you've got a job um um i hope we all continue to to grow and to learn new things um but to see someone developing across the you know one year or three or four years or something is uh, can be really exciting and very touching to to watch a, a musical voice be born as it were so uh yeah so it's on a, on a you know on a um when i'm just giving a, a master class sometimes you know just seeing someone get it in in that moment can be really thrilling but it's it's also the 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 long-term progress, which is really nice to watch. Thank you. And about teaching, uh, what led you to start the LIP project? <laughs> the LIP project, my lockdown insanity prevention. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the title says it all, really. I mean, initially, um, when my orchestra, well, when, when cultural life in the Netherlands and everywhere else stopped uh, we had 10 weeks where we weren't playing uh, in the orchestra we couldn't we couldn't 
get together to even rehearse. Um, I thought first, what am I going to do? Well, um, I can either learn to circular breathe or I could make some little tutorials on uh, YouTube. And I decided that um, maybe I'll do circular breathing another time. And I, I uh, <laughs> so it, it, it started really because um, some of the first things that were cancelled, uh, aside from the orchestra, were masterclasses. And I just thought it's one thing, I mean, everyone, struggled during uh, the lockdown it was it was horrific for everyone but i think um maybe mostly so for students who have you know decided to 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 start on this path of becoming a professional musician and suddenly all the lessons are online and suddenly the um you know everything fell away um what can I do for this generation, for the young students whose the masterclasses that I had, which were cancelled? How can I help these students? How can I reach out? Um, and I've got a terrible internet connection in my practice room. So uh, online teaching was not a possibility. Um, but I thought, well, I could record some, just some thoughts about various technical issues or some orchestral repertoire pieces. Um, so I just one morning after breakfast, I wrote down a list of the 10 things that I teach most often in my master classes. And I thought, well, maybe I just make a little five or 10 minute video about when you're playing Brahms 4, these are the things that I listen for and this that I work on. And maybe, um, maybe it's useful for someone else, but in the first instance, it's helpful for me <laughs> to um to keep me busy during these because i always need to have a sort of project um and uh so this is how it all started really and i wrote down you know 10 10 things like you know vibrato and um uh, brahms for um i don't know all the, these um breathing uh and made myself a little schedule so so it would keep me motivated i got a deadline i've told everyone you know when i started i had 17 followers on youtube uh and i checked this week i think it's uh, six and a half thousand i have now um so it's obviously um reaching people and it's people are finding it useful so that's that's really nice, but um, in in the first case, I have I have to say it was really to keep me motivated and interested, um, and uh, to have something to do, <laughs> constructive. <laughs> yes, and it was an incredible idea for us. <laughs> yeah. Glad so, you liked it. Do you ever thought about writing a book uh, about your flute secrets? <laughs> oh well they're not secrets that's why i share them on youtube <laughs> um now i i wrote a book when i started teaching in the hague um i wrote a kind of it wasn't they they were not my exercises they i collected them um so like a, a museum curator i put together my favorite exercises from my favorite books um, and I made a little workbook for my students. Um, I don't know that. Um, yes, I think I I'm think really it's... curious now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's um, they're, they're, like I said, it's no, no, no secrets. And um, I mean, I, I've many many nice uh, books which i i use but some i found myself using one or two exercises from this book one or two exercises from that book and if you have to carry all the book around um so for it started again for myself okay then i just make a photocopy of this exercise and i always have it in my bag and so i had this bundle of you know loose pages photocopies from different books of the exercises that I like the best and I thought oh well you know maybe my students find this helpful starting point even for for 
thinking of their own exercises to do every day. So that's how that book started. But, you know, De La Sonorité and Trevor Y exercises and uh, Peter Lucas Graf exercises and Tafna Gobert, of course. And, and um, yeah, I had my, my own way of practicing scales so that they always uh, sort of fit into a, a, a certain pattern and, well, I mean, it was not really very, um, very new or innovative, but it was just I collected them and uh, made them for my for my students. So I think if I were to write a book, then it would I would get into a lot of trouble with copyright. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I, I started this series of uh, my favorite flute books because I thought, you know, there are, there are such uh, great books already out there. Why do I need to write a book? Sure. But maybe just to <laughs> remind people of how good some of the books are that are out there. <laughs> yeah, we have amazing literature already. <laughs> yes, really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, what do you like best about performing? Performing? Um, well, that's sort of, that's that's what we do it for, isn't it? To tell a story to share um share our how we see a piece um i i see myself very much as as a translator so i'm i'm not the i'm not the creative person that wrote the music that we have composers to do that but i am the the way to get the composer's creativity to the audience. And um, I love that process of, of bringing a piece to life. So before I go on stage, I always, the last thing I think before I go on stage is I want, I want the audience to love this piece as much as I love the piece. Um, and that helps, that helps me with uh, nerves to an extent that it's, it's not about me it's about the music that that's the the um the the focus of why we're all there and yeah i i i've always loved that energy that you get from performing for people you know in the in the the lockdown performing for a camera is something very different um i think this conversation I don't know how many people are watching us now today, but it would be a very different sort of energy when we could see all those people and be in the same space as all those people. I think in a concert, there's a very special energy that happens from whether it's 30 people or 3000 people all listening to that same music happening at that point in time, that sort of concentrated energy, which is such a magical experience. And I think we've all realized that um, a live stream concert isn't quite the same experience for the performer and for the for the listener. In a way, it's been wonderful because we've been able to hear live streams of concerts happening on the other side of the planet that we wouldn't physically be able to get to. So it's obviously got some huge positive um, aspects, but it's not the same as being in the concert hall, is it? <laughs> For me, anyway. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we want to know about um, how was your first experience with a professional orchestra? My first experience with a professional orchestra. I think it must have been the London Philharmonic Orchestra, and I was playing a Mahler Symphony, and I was playing, I think, second flute. And I think I was called in at the last minute. And um, I, I remember being absolutely blown away by the sheer dynamic contrast. So I thought it was Im incredible how softly people were playing and how loud, you know, that, that this was so vivid. Um, and it was a... Um, 
as I remembered, it was not something that we, I can't remember whether I, it's a very long time ago, <laughs> um, but I, I can't remember whether I was called in and maybe I was only involved in the last rehearsal or maybe there was only one rehearsal. I can't honestly remember, but I remember sort of thinking, oh gosh, so that was the, that was the rehearsal um, and now it's concert time. So that all happening very fast, which was um, quite thrilling in brackets, terrifying. <laughs> um, but just the sheer energy of hearing those those waves of sound and how huge the sound could be and how fragile it had to be. Of course, that's a Mahler symphony is by its very nature uh, pushes those extremes. Um, but that that was that was my overriding memory of that first first time in a you know a paid orchestral concert. <laughs> that must be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, terrifying but wonderful. I loved it. Yes, yes. yes. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, changing a bit of topic, uh, it is your choice uh, not to work in an educational institution. Yes, I, um, well, I'm visiting professor at the Royal Academy of Music in London. And so I go there two or three times a year for a few days. Um, but in terms of the regular uh, teaching, I don't teach at an institute. I did for 11 years. I taught at the Royal Conservatory in The Hague. Um, and for various reasons, um, I left um and and started up the netherlands uh, flute academy so that's back in in uh, actually 2007 that that i i left teaching the in the hague and met suzanne wolf uh, with whom um we together started the netherlands flute academy and we met in the summer of 2007 um and she wanted to do something to support young Dutch flute players, and because she had she had been uh, she had had flute lessons as a teenager and sort of hadn't been motivated to keep going. And she, as you know, as um, later on in her life, she really regretted that she didn't go further with it. And so she said, "Oh, I want to do something so that other teenagers don't fall into the same trap as I did." And she asked my help for how can I help uh, young Dutch players? And I just left The Hague. And one of the reasons was that um, coming as a foreigner to the Netherlands um, and having them um, having won the position in the orchestra, I wanted to give something back to uh, Dutch flute life, let's say. And I realized that every year the level of my class was going up in The Hague, but the number of Dutch students was going down. And so I thought, oh, well, maybe I can somehow use my energy with younger students. But of course, it's like a pyramid. Um, the, the, the younger you get, the more there are. So, you know, maybe let's say 100 um, kids start playing the flutes maybe 10 go to conservatory and two or three get a great job. So you have this sort of pyramid form. So I thought, okay, if I'm starting with younger students, there's going to be more of them. So how do I do that as one person? So this is, this is why the uh, Netherlands Flute Academy really uh, started. And so Suzanne and I together, we, um, created actually the, the summer course that I would have liked to have gone to if I'd been a teenager. Um, so this this was how, how that all started. But it is, yeah, it's my choice really um, to be honest, it was it was a question of I couldn't be the teacher I wanted to be. Um, I missed my students when I was away on tour for three weeks. I had a wonderful um, assistant at that time, Jeroen Bron, and so the students had a lesson every week. Maybe they missed me, I don't know, but um, I missed them, you know, so it was, it, it felt like I wasn't really doing that job um, 
to the best of my ability. And at the same time, um, I thought, well, I, 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 um, maybe one day I will be a full-time teacher. But at the moment, let's say I'm a full-time performer and sometimes I give a masterclass and this is my way of, of, um, um, of yeah, fulfilling my passion for teaching is one of masterclasses. And it could be, you know, going to a conservatoire for one or two or three days, um, or it could be doing a course, something intensive. But it's it's not the week in, week out, uh, year in, year out. Um, um, in, yeah, um, investment in time, if you like, that um, I I would like to 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 have if I was um, teaching full time. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, a lot of sense, yeah. actually. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So what uh, are the things you wish you had learned during your musical education? <laughs> well, one thing I've mentioned already, circular breathing. I can't circular breathe. And I think I'm too old now to learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I do wish that I'd uh, learned that earlier on. and. Uh, I remember Robert Dick telling me I met him in a, um, a summer festival in France, in Nice, um, and I must have been about 20. And Robert Dick came up to me and said, can you circular breathe yet? And I said, no, no, you must learn. Yes, okay, and sorry, but I still haven't learned. Um, and I'd, so I do wish I'd, I'd learned that. I also wish I'd learned to um, improvise because I think that would be a useful uh, skill to have. Um, on a very, very practical, not directly connected to music, but I wish I'd learned to type, you know, because we spend so much time writing emails and you know using a keyboard and i i type with two fingers which means that i spend most of my time on the delete button um <laughs> so i do wish i'd learned to type so uh yeah <laughs> so we have an interesting um a question about someone who's watching us um so Tiago asks you, how do you cope with the pressure of being flute section leader in one of the best orchestras mm -hmm. in the world? Well, um, <laughs> yes, it is, it is a pressure. Um, I'm very lucky that we have the most lovely section. Um, we are incredibly good friends. We are very, uh, we all play quite differently. We all come from different countries. So I have a wonderful, uh, colleague uh, who's uh, principal with me, Kerstin McCall from Germany, and then uh, Julie Moulin from France, Maria uh, um, Semochuk from Ukraine, and uh, Vincent Kortfrind from Belgium on Piccolo. And we, when we're on tour, we always have at least one dinner with all of us together. We have at least one evening um, each season maybe at the beginning or the end of the season when we have a party together with all our partners and children and everything. Um, so I think that it starts with a very strong friendship and respect for one another within the section. Um, so this, it, it makes it very easy being a flute section leader of such a lovely, lovely uh, group. It's, I love, um, one of the, 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 the parts of my job playing in the orchestra uh, that I love the most is when you have a duo with an oboe, with a clarinet, with a horn, with a violin, whatever, trying to mix sounds with other instruments. So I love this um, um, sort of creating a new instrument. So flute and oboe making a flobo or flute and clarinet making a flarinet and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so I love that 
that sense of music making. I'm very happy I'm not a second flute. I think I didn't play very much second flute in my life, but I think it's a really hard job to do because, and especially, I mean, I have huge respect for my colleagues who sit on my right, who have two very different principles because Kirsten is a fantastic player, but we play very differently. And your job as a second is to match the first in terms of timing. And I think we both have quite different timing in terms of sound, in terms of phrasing and what have you. So um, I think in many ways, uh, a second flute is a much more difficult job because you're matching another flute voice. Um, so in a way you have to change your flute voice to fit another flute. Whereas my job is for my flute voice to fit another instrument. So there's this, um, that's a quite a different um, function, but um, I mean, I'm I'm I am blessed with having a really wonderful team around me, and we are very supportive and inspiring. I mean, the people, the inspiration I get from my colleagues around me is um, is fantastic, and um, so this helps a lot with the stress. But it is it is stressful, yes. <laughs> Oh, back to the think, education. Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. I was just going to say, um, there's a wonderful saying, if you find a job you love, you will never work another day in your life. And it feels like that a lot of the time. So, yes, I consider myself <laughs> very lucky in that respect. <laughs> I think we are all. <laughs> um, so about, the, um, again, the education. Uh, what would your, your advice uh, be to a student who confessed to you that he wants to give up his musical career due to changes and the new uh, insurgent musical world and not exactly because of his technical and musical skills? That's a very, um, very moving um, question and a very powerful question. Um, I always say to people, I'm going to answer it sort of a bit indirectly. I think I'm quite often asked by, I mean, through the Netherlands Flute Academy um, by let's say 16, 15, 16, 17 year olds. Well, I'm thinking of maybe going to university or maybe going to music college. What do you think? Do you, ha do you think I have the skill uh, to go to music college? And my answer is always the same. It doesn't, um, irrespective of how talented um, a player is or not, I turn the question around and say, well, is it for you like, well, I could be a dentist or a, a lawyer or a teacher, or I could be a flute player. Is it, is it kind of 50-50, you know, when you have this situation, do the other thing. I was told I had two wonderful, wonderful teachers um, who I'm, who I adore and I'm still very close to, um, and they both told me, "Don't, don't go into music. It, it can be a wonderful uh, hobby. You can enjoy playing music in your free time, but for your work, do something else. It's such a hard um, life, hard job." And of course, I respect um, their opinion and appreciate that they told me this. But I thought, I can't live with myself if I don't try. So I'm going to, you know, I, I would be so, I could, I could sort of, I had a vision of myself, you know, uh, uh, 20 years down the road doing another job. I don't know what. Um, and thinking, oh. How would my life have been if I tried to be a flute player? Oh, I should have tried, you know? And I didn't want to have this, this feeling that I didn't even try um, because it was, it was, it was um, something I really, it was a, a drive, a passion. I almost think, I've said it to colleagues at the entrance exams for, the, for conservatory, I think we should say no to everyone. And only the people who knock down the door and say, I have to come to the conservatory. 
only these people should be allowed in because I think in a, in a sense, you have to have this, uh, well, it's known as the, the fire in your belly, no? That, that you have to have this, this, this drive, this passion, because I think it can be a very difficult um, career. It can be very uncertain. And some people can cope with this uncertainty. Some people enjoy this uncertainty. Other people need more security and need to know that they have a monthly salary coming in and that those those positions are sadly becoming uh, fewer and fewer. And this is maybe another discussion. Um, should there be more music in our society? Should there be more concerts? Should there be more orchestras? Um, then you need more audience. So then the audience needs to understand what they're experiencing. So we need more music education in schools. So that's a that's another uh, kind of topic. But um, so I think, in a way, the the of course you need to have you need to have um, this the talent. You need to have the dedication. Even with those two things, you need to be to have an element of luck of being in the right place at the right time. You know that a job comes up when you are ready to audition um, that you feel that, you know, uh, I mean, now we have been the same flute section, for example, in Concertgebouw for, I think, at least 10 years, and it will be another 10 years before anyone retires. So that means that if we all stay, there will be a fixed group for 20 years. It means that if someone's dream is to be in Concertgebouw Orchestra in the flute section, Either something awful has to happen to one of us and that we are not there, um, or they, they get a long wait, you know. So if you can have you can have dreams and you can have the the drive, you can have the ambition, you can have the talent, but there is always an element of luck. And I think that someone making the decision, you know, maybe when they're at music college or maybe they they they've left music college and they think, you know what, this is just all too uncertain for me this is this is um this is not making me happy then i have only respect for people who say you know what i can um i will keep my flute playing as something that i love doing um next to my job as a teacher as a whatever um but it's it's never a it's it's always a something painful, you know, when someone um, has to make this decision. Um, but so that's why I think that we, people should think seriously, carefully about um, going to music college in the sense of um, is this is this a real fire in my belly? Am I going to put everything into this? Um, or can I keep flute playing as something that I love doing when I have time? My, for example, my my dentist is a fantastic bassoon player, and because in his career as a dentist he's able to to um, I'm not saying he doesn't work hard, but you know when he can he can um, arrange his schedule. So that he has enough free time to be doing what he loves, which is playing bassoon. I have a CD of him recording, fantastic playing. You know, and then he's he's able to to manage his life um, in a way that he has he's fulfilled musically, and he has his 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 day job and his his passion, and they are two different things. My day job and my passion are the same thing, and I appreciate every day that this is um, a huge privilege. Um, so yeah, I hope that's not too uh, gloomy um, an answer. But um, I think in the end of the day, you have to be doing something which, um, not which makes you happy, but which fulfills you. 
and there will be compromises you have to make um and to make that easier more bearable um yes i don't i don't really know where that sentence is going but it's um it's it's not always an easy career path and if you're you know if you're lucky and uh, successful it, there is no better job in the world um but i there are also people who i know um who are amazing players and who just haven't had you know come second in every audition for example and then at the certain certain point then there's more frustration um and then you lose your love maybe for your instrument or for music making um so i would a short answer to your question is that i fully respect and support uh, an individual's choice to pursue their dream or their um, answer to where they they hope their life goes you know whichever yes. way that goes yes sorry that was Thank a very you. long rambly answer <laughs> don't worry <laughs> thank you so about this do you think there is an age limit for getting a first job in an orchestra uh first job in the orchestra i'm presuming you mean a sort of a paid paid position and i think that's less crucial than um orchestral experience so um i would encourage everyone to get as much orchestral experience as they if that's what they aiming to do eventually um youth orchestras um amateur orchestras university orchestras conservatoire orchestras conducting students um put together orchestras any orchestral experience you can find this is the most crucial thing for me um when when people apply for for example a, a position in my orchestra then i always take i don't know whether my colleagues do the same but i i look at the the curriculum and see the um, the experience that they have and balance that with the age now if someone is well let's say 27 and maybe they never had a job but they have played in in every youth orchestra possible in every amateur orchestra possible this this is uh it all, all adds up to a sort of to orchestral experience so i don't think your your question was about an, what is is there an age limit for an orchestral job um of course i mean you know if you've never had a job and you're auditioning at i don't know at at my age 52 then then people might think oh that's strange she's never had a, a, a position in a job in in an orchestra before but if someone comes 27 they've never had a position a paid position in an orchestra but they have a lot of orchestral experience i think that's that's um a different story so yes and no i think is the short answer <laughs> um just um yeah if that's that's the 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 direction that your you want your life to go in and i knew from when i was 12 years old i played in orchestra the first time and i thought wow i want to do a lot of this in my life i didn't know you could be be a full time that it could be your work um but I just knew that it was something it was I was so excited about being part of that sound and be, being that little part of this huge machine. Um, and I just thought, this is really cool. I really <laughs> want to do a lot of this. Um, and and so every opportunity I had, um, I, I grabbed with both hands to, to play in any orchestra um, that I could. Um, and you know when when you're looking at um uh, a curriculum something 
an audition, uh, an orchestra like uh, European Union Youth Orchestra, August of Mal Orchestra, or Schleswig Holstein, or Fabia, all these kind of youth orchestras where there's incredibly competitive audition process. For me, that counts as professional, um, even though you're not uh, paid for being in those orchestras, they count for me as being like a professional orchestra because you've had to go through that um, uh, audition process. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, com completely. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, how did you feel after? How did you feel after reaching your goal? If you have already reached it, was it a feeling of total <laughs> accomplishment or, on the opposite, an irrational fear of the future? <laughs> well, I'll, I don't know what my goal is. My goal is always my next concert, um, and um, yes, it's my. I mean. I, I was, of course, very fortunate. I was 25 when I won my position in, in the orchestra and I love it as much today as I did then and I feel as lucky today as I did then. And um, I think my, my goal is to keep doing this um, to the best of my ability for as long as I can. Um, so in a way, I haven't reached my goal and to be doing what I'm doing today, next year, or in five years' time, or in ten years' time, is uh, that's really my goal because I really do love what I do. Um, and like I say, um, you know, find a job you love and you'll never work another day. I, I, I. That is a motto which I believe a hundred percent because I'm still surprised that people want to pay me for doing something that I love so much. Um, but the, the payoff is that it's, um, it's very, it's, a, it's almost a way of life, I would say, more than a job. So, um, it's very, no, no, I don't only mean time consuming, but it's, 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 it's almost all consuming. It's affected major life decisions, let's say. <laughs> um, so, uh. Yes, it's um, so. What was the question about goals? Yes, I'll I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> because my goal is to just uh, keep doing um, what I'm doing for as long as I can. Because uh, I love it so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, we want to know who inspires you the most in life. Oh, gosh. Who or what inspires me the most in my life? Well, I mean, in um, musically, I have to say, I am surrounded day in, day out by the most amazing musicians in the Concertgebouw Orchestra, which are constantly inspiring me to push myself further and to be better and to, um, yeah, to to add to the the... The vitamins and the 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 passion that is the Concertgebouw Orchestra. We have incredible conductors and soloists that come uh, every week to work with us, and that is a constant source of inspiration. Um, I think so. The 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 musicians that I surround myself with, um, my duo partners, uh, my sister and my, my long-term uh, piano duo partner, Andrew West, um, are incredible musicians to work with. And um, so they are a constant musical inspiration. Um, yes, I, th I think I love surrounding myself with, with interesting people who make me think, who push me, who um who are you know uh, on a path to to growing to developing um so i think people friends family 
um, are my biggest inspiration. I think the people around you, that, that is colors your life so much. Um, so I try and surround myself with the most lovely people and I'm very lucky in that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Tiago uh, made another question and uh, he says that you spoke about uh, emotions and showing them to the audience. What are the thoughts on becoming emotional during a performance, but not letting your emotions affect the technical issues of what you are playing? Where do you find the balance? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I remember hearing an interview with uh, British pianist uh, John Lill, who was a, I think he won the Tchaikovsky competition like back in the 70s. And he said that the performer should be like a clear pane of glass that the composer, the, the audience can see or hear the, the composer's voice through the glass. So we should not be colored and patterned. And so it's not about the, us, the performer, um, being emotional. Um, it's about um, us being letting the composer's voice come through. And my mom, my mother was a, 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 a drama teacher, and I remember her saying, "It's like, um, of course, you don't. If you are playing a horrible character on stage, maybe a, a murderer, it doesn't mean you have to have murderous thoughts in order to convey that. So, it's there's a lot of um, what what we can do if we." To draw the parallel to music, we can sort of be quite uh, analytical in the sense of, okay, this phrase is, um, I think the composer wants this phrase to be, uh, well, let's say, say, take something very simple, something very joyful, happy. So how do I create a joyful, happy sound? Um, I'm going to use a very singing vibrato, I'm going to use a very open sound, whatever. And so being quite analytical in that sense, and in that sense, you don't have to be happy or joyful yourself when you're playing that phrase. Because the next phrase is maybe the composer, is, is, it's, it's all um, very somber or intense. And so then as a performer, I don't have to be happy, joyful, and then e extremely somber and intense. But I have to take a step back and be able to analyze what is it that makes this happy, joyful sound? What is it that makes this intense, sorrowful uh, sound? And translate that into sound. So it's, it's not about being emotional myself in that when I'm on stage telling the story, I have to understand what the composer's intention might have been. And of course, that's also always a, a, an element of translation, isn't it? What, what did the composer um, mean or intend? Um, that is in itself a, a translation. And then how do I translate that intention into sound? So that's why we can still play uh, Mozart concerto hundreds of years after it was first written because every performer every day is is uh, slightly different and there's a slightly different take on Mozart's text. I hope that answers the question. I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. How do you deal with yourself when you feel overwhelming or melancholic? What to use as an inspiration in these moments? Oof. Well, I think everyone knows this experience, and I think maybe the last uh, couple of years um, have been even more challenging than than uh, at other times. Um, I think, as a as a human being and as a flute player, I think. Um, 
we can take a very lowest common denominator and say we need to keep breathing and i think the power of breathing is so underestimated um and i think that we can um i mean i do i i have done some some meditation and um uh, that sort of thing in my life i don't do it on a regular basis but um, simply breathing out, breathing in good thoughts and, and letting bad thoughts out um, is such a simple and such a powerful tool. Um, so I, I do do yoga on a very regular basis and that's very connected to, to breathing. Um, it's breathing forms the... the um if i can't sleep at night i do breathing exercises if i'm anxious before going on stage which is always then i do breathing exercises um so i think that the power of of breath of fresh air you know going for a walk can do um do wonders it's a glorious uh, sunny day here but even in the rain you can still breathe um so uh yes a very simple answer breathing <laughs> thank you i think it's my time right <laughs> sorry <laughs> so how did the idea of project paloma your cd that was released in september last year come about project paloma this started the first two seeds of this um, actually were started a very long time ago, before you were even born. Um, I started learning the Hindu Mitsunata in 1984. And I remember taking it to my first flute lesson and my flute teacher, Margaret Ogonofsky, said, well, it's, yes, it sounds lovely, but it sounds a little bit friendly and a little bit cheerful and do, do you know when this piece was written oh yeah 1936 yeah maybe life wasn't so um very easy going in 1936 um yes maybe maybe there is some a darkness which i need to explore in this piece then a few years after that, I heard uh, Frank Martin Ballada for the first time and was completely horrified and terrified listening to this piece. Oh, and that was written in 1939. And then Prokofiev Sonata, 1942, Dutier uh, Sonatine, uh, Chandelinos, Sankan Sonatine, um, Martinu Sonata, all this incredible repertoire that we have. And I started thinking, wow, this is incredible that all my favorite pieces are for, were written in these years of war. Um, and yet the flute is also, is always or very often used to represent something like innocence or simplicity or peace or in you know in the orchestra when when you get a the the peaceful after the storm think of the william tell overture for example we've had all the storm and the, the chromatic uh, um, trombones and then what do we hear we hear the flute and coronglay and the sun has come out and the birds are singing again and the air is fresh and there's the flute. And so these two things um, formed one hy yeah, hypothesis. This is in, in my mind, this, this, this thought that through these horrendous years of the war, um, that so many composers wrote for this instrument, which is, mostly used or often used to symbolize peace and innocence um and so it, it and and for years i've i've wanted to 
present these these masterworks in the context of war with with texts and poetry uh, written in the time or about this time and i'm a, one of the musicians there's a fantastic organization um called splendor here in in amsterdam which is a collective of 50 musicians which um have a rehearsal and concert space which we sort of um where we we are free to program whatever we want and i was invited to join this collective a few years ago and i thought aha now is my moment when i can present these these this repertoire uh, the the war years repertoire um with the text poem poetry from that time um and so i i devised a series of five concerts um each based around a, a different uh, region, geographical region. Um, so the first volume was about uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Um, that was part one. So doing the, the Hindemith Sonata, Martin, uh, Martin Ballade, uh, the Karl Frühling fantasy, Boris Blacher and Hans Gall, a piece for, for solo piano. And we presented the first concert in December 19. And someone in the audience said, but you need to record these for CD. And so um, I thought, well, yes, actually, I never recorded any of these big repertoire pieces. And this, this you know, let's see if we can find a, a record company who is willing to do this. And Zephyr Records um, from the Netherlands said, was immediately excited about the idea and so actually just the day yesterday day before yesterday i got home from recording the second cd prokofiev sonata and weinberg 12 miniatures and that will be released in october the first one is already uh released and um so we set up a website projectpaloma.com and so you can see the whole project what we have planned for the future and the concerts and the CDs and uh, so this is a kind of yeah something which started a long long time ago as a little seed in my mind um, and it's really exciting to to get the opportunity to bring it to life <laughs> yeah that's amazing great <laughs> so now we have another question uh, from a friend flutist friend from Nigeria uh, okay. So, he asks, what will your advice to someone who wishes to be more of a solo flautist than an orchestra flautist? Gosh, um, I, I mean, I, I'm lucky enough that my, my, um, my work is, is, I, uh, is very divided uh, or very full and varied so I have orchestra life and I do a lot of chamber music and sometimes I do solo things it was I to be honest there was never my intention or my my dream so it it's sort of um the solo work that I do um has I mean I wouldn't say it happened sort of by accident but it's it's it was never my my ambition so i don't really know how to to advise um someone who wants to be a solo flutist um i think it's uh, there are very few flute players who um only play um solo um i can only think of really very few and if you take i mean two of um of the biggest names if we say uh, james galway and emmanuel Pau, and of course they also had an orchestral background um so um i mean maybe this is not the the i'm not maybe the most <laughs> uh well qualified to answer this question in a sense um i mean to i'm quite interested in why someone would want to only do solo um playing to be absolutely honest um we have we have some wonderful 
recital repertoire, concerto repertoire, um, but it's not in the same league in terms of volume as a pianist or a violinist or even a cellist. Um, so um, I, I would just put a little question mark. Why are you wanting to put all your energies in one direction? And I think that actually um, there's a lot to be gained from aiming a, a, for, for a, a broader sort of mix of um, repertoire in your professional life. So that's a sort of completely non-answer. I'm so sorry, but I just don't no. really know. <laughs> no, but it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But maybe competition could be a way and um, uh, getting management um, uh, would be a, a way to aim for. But um, I, yes, I'm not the most qualified to answer that question. <laughs> Maybe ask uh, someone like uh, uh, Jasmine Choi or, or someone who is, is really doing a, a solo career. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but we have to finish. <laughs> okay. But we have one last question for you. Yes. So uh, any advice to young musicians who are beginning their career that you want to share? Uh, advice to young musicians well um i think have um a clear plan of where you want to be where do you see yourself 10 years from now and it can be a very difficult you know let's say you're 18 or 16 where do i want to be when i'm 26 28 it feels like so far away but it will be here before you know it um, and if you know where you want to be in 10 years time, you know, well, I should be about halfway there when I'm in five, five years time. And that means that in two years time, I should be that far on the path. That means that next year I should be doing this. That means, okay, today I should be doing this. So it's a very clear way of motivating yourself um, is to have a, you know, a long career, a vision, a dream. Um, and I would go so far, so far as to say, you know, if you are thinking in terms of an orchestral career, am I more a first flute player? Am I more a piccolo player? Am I more a second flute player? Um, and maybe in the first instance, only going for the jobs that you think, no, I can really see myself doing that job. I know I could do that job rather than sort of saying, OK, I'm going to go for every single job that comes up this year and um you know i'll see how they all go it's all experience because every time you do an audition and you get a no or you don't get past the first round that hurts a little bit even if it's not a job that you thought you could do or want it or in a country you wanted to live in or whatever it's still a no and that hurts um so um so i would I would think carefully about where you want to be going for. I, I had I'd said to myself, OK, I'm not a piccolo player. I've done very little second flute playing in my life. Um, so that's not where my experience lies. I, lies. I had done a lot of first flute playing. So for the first five years after music college, I'm only going to go for first flute jobs. Um, and if I applied for something and then I thought, um, no, actually, you know, um, near the time I thought, well, no, actually, I don't want to live in that country or the profile of that orchestra is not something that is really something I want to, um, yeah, uh, I mean, whether it's an opera orchestra or uh, something that you think, well, that's not really what where my passion lies, um, then maybe don't go for that audition. Um, maybe. Um, so, so just sort of being that, that um, clear about what your dream is, is all I'm saying. Um, and then make sure that people, that you know who is around and wh which orchestra, inform yourself what is going on in the music life be well informed and make sure that people know where you are, what you're doing. Um, 
don't be the person that says, yeah, but the orchestras don't, don't phone me up. Well, do they have your phone number? Well, uh, no, you know? So make sure that people um, send your curriculum to orchestras um, maybe once a year that they know that you're there, that you're, that this is still your email address, that this is still your mobile phone number, that they can contact you. Um, and, um, and know where they're, you know, keep your finger on the pulse with um, uh, who might be retiring soon, or that there is a vacancy there, there was an audition that they didn't take someone. Um, so just sort of really keeping your finger on the pulse, um, meeting people, talking to people, um the world is so connected these days there are all sorts of ways of finding information out um so use that um i think it's it's a slightly sorry you want to you it, it's time to to finish i'm talking too much but it's <laughs> it's um the, Don't worry. i think that the danger in this time when they're, they're everything with click click and you can find out information um I think that it makes us all, and I'm as guilty as anyone, um, that we think, oh, yeah, I know that that information can be found. And it's just click, click, and then I'll found, find it, which makes makes us maybe a little bit lazy with actually taking that click, click, because at some point you have to do the click, click to, to find the information. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. Be, be, um, make sure that you're in touch with what's going on and that people can get in touch with you. Um, people won't look, look for you. You know, I'm, uh, I'm amazed that I've got a website. I've had a website for 20 years or something. Um, and I'm still amazed at how many, how many times people go through the orchestra to say, yes, we want to contact Emily Bynan. And they ask the orchestra, and I think, well, you can actually just put Emily Bynan in Google and, and other search machine, machines are available. Um, but you can find uh, my website, but people um, often don't make that, that step. It's fine, but it's, it's just to show that um, you need to be as contactable as possible. Um, and that means many different things in these day, this day and age. But uh, there's so much information out there and use it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, it was nice lovely to, to have you here. <laughs> uh, lovely to speak to you both. And I hope that I answered some of the questions. <laughs> some yeah, of them don't worry. Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Thank you. And uh, I hope to You're see you welcome. again. <laughs> Yes, yeah. I look forward to it. Yeah. Thank Bye you everyone. both very much. <laughs>